Okay, if, if y'all wouldn't mind, just for a second, if everyone could be really, really quiet. Everyone? Quiet, please, just for a second. Just got to make sure that the microphone's not picking up. Okay, that looks all right. I was having trouble finding a radio frequency to work with, so. All right, um, I got a new microphone, so I hope this doesn't turn out to be a complete disaster today. Um, hopefully it doesn't come out too loud or too quiet on the video, we'll see. Everybody is handed in their uh, take home. Anyone else? Last call, remember it's due at the beginning of class. Not five minutes, ten minutes later. How did that second one go compared to the first one? Did y'all feel a little more comfortable with it? I was, I was, over the weekend, I was like, well, you know, if they're turning in a mini exam, then that means it must be time for the next one. And I was like, all right, are they ready to do the next one? I looked at it, and uh, you can actually do everything on this before I even start today's material. So this is uh, up through, this is going to finish off chapter 10. So this is up through, uh, actually, the concepts on this one are just 10, 7, and 10, 8. So it's four problems. That's it. It's due a week from today. I've posted this online already in both the PDF and CDF format. Sorry? Yeah, go ahead. There you all go. Thank you. Are you ready to go? I'm not going to go over the solutions for that second mini exam. We're just going to get right into today, to today's material. Um, we left off last time. We had just, just barely got our feet into chapter 11, right? And we were talking about 11.1, which was functions of several variables. And we realized that if you have three variables in an equation and you can solve for z, then you can always write z as some function of x and y, right? So z can be looked at as some function of two variables, x and y. And if you are to do this, it will draw what in three-dimensional space? A surface, right? This is going to draw you a surface. Curious to know how you feel about this. Do you think we could, uh, we could do something like this? Or something like this. Uh, yeah? All of these have something in common. Two inputs, one output. Two inputs, one output. If you look at z equals f of x, y, the domain is the ground, right? The x, y plane, and well, some part of it. And it graphs these points that come up and become this surface that's kind of waving around above the ground, yeah? If you do it this way instead, then you're still going to get a surface, but now your ground is actually the yz plane, which is, means it's kind of like a wall, right? In the room, it's kind of like one of the walls. And then your surface is coming out this way, and your, your, your sheet is actually like that instead of like this. Does that make sense? Sideways? And then if you do something like this, um, oops, sorry, this should be what? Y. Um, then your y coordinate is a function of x and z. And again, the xz plane would be your domain, and then the, the, x, uh, the y coordinate would come out and give you your surface. So this is a traditional surface sideways, and then this one sideways again, right? Make sense? That's going to come into play later on, all right? All right, so we, we are going to start today by talking about a surface here, f of x equals x natural log of 
y squared minus x. And we want to try and determine, first of all, the function's value at a point, 3, 2. Then determine the domain and sketch the domain in two-dimensional space. And then determine the range of the function. OK? So let's, let's start with part A. We are going to find f of 3, 2. Before I forget, um, not only am I doing the microphone a little different now, I am also um, going to record at uh, 1080p instead of 720p, which means that it's going to be four files when you go to look at it. So today, later on today, it'll be four files on YouTube if you are going to look at it. And then what I'll do is I'll come in later and I can use YouTube to compress them down to one file, but that usually will take about a day to happen. So initially, it'll be four files. Within a day, it'll be one, one video, all right? Just FYI. Um, so all we do here is just replace x with 3 and y with 2, right? So x is 3, we get 3, natural log, y squared is 4, take away 3. And what does that give you right there? 0, right? Because natural log of 1 is 0. So this gives you 0. Now, there are certain things we cannot plug in, right? Someone give me an example of an ordered pair that I could not plug into this function. 3, negative 2. 3. 3. 4, 2. Yeah, 4, 2 wouldn't work. I'm at 3, 0. What would that give you? 3 natural log of what's y? 0? So 0 take away 3. That would give you natural log of a negative number, which you can't do. Right? So there are certain points that, that are OK, certain points that aren't. So we're trying to find in this problem the domain for part b, which is give me a graphical representation of all of the points that are allowed. Right? So what are the things we have to concern ourselves with for part b? What are the things that would cause us a problem when you look at that function? Yeah, the natural log function cannot handle 0, can't handle negative numbers. So we need the thing inside of the natural log function, which we call the what? The thing inside of a function is called the argument. You all remember hearing that before? The argument of a function is the thing that's being plugged in, the, what's being evaluated. So what I, need, what I need for part b is that the argument of the natural log function not be 0 and not be negative, which means it needs to be greater than 0, strictly greater than, right? Then I'm guaranteed that the points will work. So all points that satisfy this quadratic inequality would be representative of my domain. Questions? I need that to be true, right? Now, if I were to come in here and say, all right, well, I don't like inequalities. Let me first just switch this over to an equation. Then I hope that we could all sketch that, right? That's a parabola. But it's, uh, it doesn't open up, right? It opens sideways. So it's going to look like this. And it would go like this, wouldn't it? No, I'm going to draw it for right now. This is uh, y squared equals x. Now, am I actually allowed to pick points on this parabola? Like, if I pick a point on this parabola, am I allowed to plug that point into my function? Well, this is equality, isn't it? If you're on this parabola, you have this e equation. What do I want? I want this, inequality, right? I don't want them to be equal. So points that satisfy this, I don't want, do I? So I don't want to draw this solid. I want to draw it dashed. Understand? We don't want to include all the points. So it's a dotted parabola. And then the question is, which side of the parabola are all your other points in your domain? The stuff over here or the stuff out on the outside? And how do we normally uh, go about determining that? Just test a point, right? Just pick a point that lives in one of the regions and test it. So a good point would be something like, uh, What's the point here? 3, 0? Does that live over here? Test that point. Oh, we did. Does that point work? No, it's undefined. 
So anything in this region shouldn't work. You could go and keep checking others. Now, a point that did work was 3, 2, right? And that point, 3, 2, can't tell, but it's outside of here. So what I know is that my domain should be on this side of the parabola. Make sense? Are there any questions? I've, I've graphed it in two-dimensional space. That is the domain of the function, vi visually. But then students will ask, well, how do you write that not visually, right? Like, how would you actually represent that set of, of points uh, without the picture? Well, here's how you'd write it. C call this set builder notation. You could say the set of all x's and y's, so all ordered pairs. Then we use a bar to say such that. So we're saying, hey, what's the domain? Well, it's all the ordered pairs such that y squared is greater than x. Done. That's it. That's the set notation of this shaded set. Everyone does understand if this, if the problem, if this had been equals, that would not be dotted, right? Okay. What about the range, part C? The range is a little more involved, because the range is the output, isn't it? What comes out of that function? What do you think? What comes out? Do you all understand why it's harder to do? Pardon me? This is the z, right? What we're trying to figure out is, is there, is there some Restriction on z, like this only spits out positive answers. Or it only spits out answers between 1 and 5, or something like that. So let's, let's look at it. Do you see any possible issues? Could, could we get positives to come out? Yes. Well, if uh, x is a positive number, that should be positive. We know the natural log spits out both positive and negative numbers, right? Think about your natural log function. Looks like this, doesn't it? That's what natural log looks like? That's natural log of x. So the natural log spits out positive numbers and it spits out negative numbers, right? The question is, to get everything out, negative infinity to infinity, can you make this right here all values between 0 and infinity, not including 0? What do you think? Let me just fix x to be 1. Okay, if x is 1, then what does that function up there turn into? f of 1y equals natural log of y squared minus 1. Do you all agree? Yeah? Still there? Yes? That's the way that would look. So this is now a function of just one variable, right? y? Can you get y, could you get y to be 0? Uh, let me ask you that. Could you actually get the input of this function to be 0? You're not allowed to do it, but could you do it? Could I let y be something that would make that 0? If y was 1, right? Okay, so if I, like, if I pick a y that's just a little bit bigger than 1, this number will be a little bit bigger than 0, right? So I can, I can create an input that's a little bit bigger than 0, which means it'll spit out a huge negative number, won't it? Can I keep on doing that and keep on plugging in things for y that are going to get me all these positive numbers? Yes? Right? Another way to look at it is what does y squared minus 1 look like? Well, it's a parabola, right? What's the lowest value on this parabola? Negative 1, right? Negative 1 all the way up to infinity. So I know that I can get any number in here between negative 1 and infinity. And the natural log function from 0 to infinity draws the whole thing. Are you all following me? What's the range of this function? Maybe you all aren't getting it. I'm hearing 0 to infinity, 1 to infinity. Negative infinity to infinity, yes. Look, 
don't look at this as natural log of x, okay? Just look at this as the natural log function. This is the input, right? This is the output. If I have a natural log function, you plug a positive number in, it's going to spit something out, yes? This right here is a natural log function. This input, you just told me this input, no matter what va values of y I pick, this input here has to be between negative 1 to infinity, right? I can make this anything between negative 1 and infinity. So the input of a natural log function that you have here can be anything between negative 1 and infinity, but any natural log function to draw the whole thing has to just go from 0 to infinity, yes? So you're going to be able to do that, right? You'll be able to produce every positive number, which means it'll pre uh, create every possible outcome from the natural log function, which dives down to negative infinity and goes up to infinity. So the range is, you could say all real numbers, you could say negative infinity to infinity. The range is a harder, a harder question to answer. Well, this graph tells you that, but the question, this is the thing I think that people are getting hung up on. Yes, of course, this graph, the range of this graph is negative infinity to infinity. But the question is, can you create every input? Does this create every input? y squared minus 1. Can, so let me show you an example. If I change this to plus 1, is it going to create everything? Can you, can you make, can you get 1 half out of this? Can you plug in a y and have it spit out 1 half? No. The smallest this is going to be is what? 1, right? So you're not going to be able to get 1 half out. The smallest we just said will be 1, right? So the smallest input you're going to have is 1. Anything bigger than 1 you'll be able to plug in, so you're going to get this part. If that were the problem, if it were, which it's not, then the range would actually be from 0 to infinity. 0 to infinity. It's subtle. I hope y'all are catching it. All right. Where's my little spray bottle? Let me go grab that. Shall we look at it? Here's the actual function. It's a surface, right? I'll move it around so we can see it a little better. It's got this weird thing happening. Do you all see that weird sort of like someone came and tore it. Someone came and tore our, our sheet right in here. It's real jaggedy. You see that? That's actually the computer freaking out. Okay? The computer doesn't know what to do there. What's happening is you're getting an asymptote. Just like the natural log function dives down to negative infinity. Like you can't keep drawing forever, right? So this is the, this is the computer trying to draw the surface. It's diving down to, to negative infinity and it's having a hard time dealing with it. So at some point it just gives up starts cutting the, the picture off, and you get these jagged edges on it. All right? So if I look at it from the side, do you see how we're, we're diving down, right? These look like logs, don't they? Each of these look like log functions. That's like a log function. And right behind there's another one, another log function. So if I hold my x value constant, like I did, right? I held x at 1, and I had a log function. That's exactly what happens here. Um, if I look at it from the top, So I'm looking, I'm standing up above this, and I'm looking down. It's pretty obvious, you know, with our domain, isn't it? We can see the domain clearly. What about this one? <clears throat> okay, let's see if we can let me make sure I plug that in. I'm all paranoid because on Friday. You'll see if you watch the homework solutions for uh, one of these sections. I had my new microphone. I was all happy about it. I did the whole video of the homework solutions. I forgot to plug the little 3.5 millimeter jack into the camera. So the audio is the audio from the camera, and it sucks. And I was all pissed off, man. But all right. What do you think? You do this one. Work on it. See if you can. Uh, all I ask is for the domain.
Anybody want to tell me what the inequality is that I'm going to need to work with here? What do I need in order for this function to be defined? 9 minus x squared minus y squared, minus y squared. Greater than or equal. So this time it's okay to be equal, right? Because you can take the square root of zero. So that's what I'm working with. This again is a nonlinear inequality. Right? It's non nonlinear. How in the world am I going to figure out what that looks like? Well, I like to go back again and go to the whole idea, the whole notion of we don't like inequalities, but equalities we're more comfortable with. So change this into an equality. This would be nine minus x squared minus y squared equals zero, right? Anybody want to tell me what that is? It's a circle. Radius three. Right, if we just move things around. Right, that's a circle of radius three. That's what it would be if it was equality, which we actually do have equality, right? So I'm going to draw myself a circle of radius 3. And I'm going to not make it dashed, right? It's going to be solid. That's supposed to be 3. Oops. OK, that's my radius of 3 right there. The question is, is it the inside or the outside? So how can you check? Just test a point, 0, 0, right? Let's just test 0, 0 and check it into the original inequality. Is it true? Is 9 minus 0 squared minus 0 squared greater than 0? Yes. So it's everything inside, isn't it, since it worked? So when I draw this thing, right, when I graph this function, it should only exist above this circle, right? Outside that circle, there's no picture. You could also have taken this and, and worked with it as, a, as an inequality and recognized again that this is almost like the equation of a circle, right? But you, this is the biggest radius you can have, right? Um, if these two squared together added up is less than or equal to 9, then it definitely would be less than or equal to 8, then 7, then 6, then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You basically get all circles going down to 0. Understand? If you flip this inequality, what would it do? It would be outside the circle, right? OK. All right. All right, what about the range? This range is a little easier than the last one. Negative what? Negative 3 to 3? Is it possible to get negative 3 out of that function? When you take the square root of a number, can it ever be negative? No, no not unless we're doing imaginary numbers, which we're not, right? So anytime you take the square root of a number, the smallest number you can ever get out would be what? Zero, right? And then in this case, what would the biggest number you could get out be? Three. And that's because the largest that the, that the uh, argument could ever be, we also call this the radicand, the largest that this number could ever be would be nine. Why? That's the only way we'll get it to work. Yeah, but why do you know that this can never become 10 or 20? Because you're subtracting a number, right? Good. That is what? X squared is always a positive number. Y squared is always positive. So when you subtract a positive, it gets smaller, right? Nine is going to get smaller. If you subtract y squared again, it's going to get smaller. Now, you could have the situation where both x and y are 0, couldn't you? In that case, you would have 9 up there, right? If x and y are 0, you get 9. Yeah? So think about this. Above this, right, the biggest point you could get out, you just said, was 3. And it happened where? At the origin. So imagine coming out 3 units. 1, 2, 3. I've got a point. Now, what about right here, if I plug in this point? That's the point 3, 0. What would come out? What would happen if you plug in 3, 0? You get 0. What if I plug in this point? 0. This one. This one. What do you think is going to happen at any point along here? 
you're going to get zero. So you've got the highest points here, all the edges are zero. You see what it looks like, right? You're showing me on the... There it is. All right? It's basically the upper hemisphere, isn't it? It's a surface. It's a top part of a sphere. I didn't answer the range. The range was what? Zero to three. Questions? Now, that's when we have a function of two variables, right? Function of two variables, the input lives where? Function of two variables, input lives in R2, output is just a number, right? Yes? Yeah. If we were to state the domain of that one, uh, the circle, uh -huh. would, would we write it as the inequality 9 minus x squared minus y squared greater than or equal to 0? Or you can move things around either way. But that's, correct. that's correct, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. So we have input two-dimensional space, output is one number, right? But there's nothing stopping us from going to a new function, f of x, y, z, where you have three inputs in a single output. But now we're starting to run out of letters, aren't we? Like, in, you know, we just, we just had just a second, z, a second ago, z is f of x, y. But now I'm going to say, hey, look, my function's actually going to have x, y, and z. And so what do I call that, you know? I'm out, like I ran out, z, right? So now you can start to use anything you want, right? I'll, I'll just, what? Huh? W. w, OK, I like w. There we go, w. So now you have, what this would require is an equation with four variables in it where you could solve for one of them in terms of the other three. If you're able to do that, if you're able to do that, you should get a, uh-oh, what would you get here? Well, you, you have three dimensions, right? Three dimensions for the input, one dimension for the output. Can you visualize the domain? Will, will we be able to visualize the domain? Yes, it'll live in three-dimensional space. But the range, the output, we can't put it together in the picture, can we? Because that would require a fourth dimension, right? which means we can't visualize these, all right? Sometimes we call these hypersurfaces because it's like a fourth dimensional surface, but uh, you can't see it. We can't, can't actually show it to you. Understand? What we did just before this, we could see the domain and the range together in one picture. Not anymore for this, but we can still ask about domains. If I have a function of three variables, we can still very, very easily discuss domain. So let's do that. Here is a function of three variables. f of x, y, z equals square root. Very similar to what we just had, right? That's, I don't know why this says a, a, b. It should be a, b, c. Was it a, b, b a while back too? Yeah. Eh, well, I never get around to updating these things. All right. What do you get when you plug in 1, 2, 0? 4? Anyone disagree? Oh, root 4. OK, root 4, which is 2. Is that OK? And then what? Part B, domain. Uh-oh. We have a square root again, right? We need to make sure that the, the argument or the radicand, right, is not zero, or not negative, sorry. So we need that 9 minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared stay bigger than or equal to zero. What is that? That's a sphere, right? If we make that an equation, if we were to convert that into an equality instead of an inequality, we could rewrite that as 9 equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's a sphere of radius 3, isn't it? But it's three-dimensional. So we've got this ball. 
right? Like that. We've got this three-dimensional ball. And right now what we're saying is that the radius of this is three, yeah? So that outside edge is this equation, just the outside surface. Are we allowed to plug in other points that are inside or outside of this? So will a point on the inside of this, this uh, ball work? Well, what did we do before? We checked, didn't we? We tested. So why don't we test a point? Why don't we test the origin? Zero, zero, zero. Does that work? So you come over here, you plug it into this. Does zero, zero work? Yes, it does, which means you include the origin. So it's everything inside that ball. So this is a truly, it's a solid ball, isn't it? As opposed to a, just a surface. So this is a solid ball radius 3. That's the domain, everyone. That's the domain. The range is nowhere to be seen, right? The range is nowhere on this picture, understand? Let me, give you, let me give you a quick example before we uh, say range. Well, I don't know. Range is pretty easy, isn't it? No? I, should, I need to quit saying that. It's easy, right? It's obvious. But it's very similar to the last problem, isn't it? What's the, what's the smallest that a square root can ever be? It would be 0. Can you make this 0? Let x be 3, let y be 0, let y be 0, z be 0, right? Then you'll have 0. So you, you know you can get 0 to come out. Um, the biggest that this thing could be is if it were just root 9, which you can do if it's 0, 0, 0. So you're going to get everything between 0 and 3 again. So the range of this is 0 to 3. What I was, getting, what I was going to say before I did that was, um, let me give you an example of a useful function of three variables. We live on Earth, right? Isn't, like if we want to get really, really precise about it, isn't the gravitational acceleration, even though we say gra gravitational acceleration is constant on Earth, it does vary, doesn't it? It varies really with where you are. You change altitudes. You know, the gravitational force does change. It fluctuates. So you could say, that the input is your x, y, and z on, on Earth, right? And the output is the actual gravitational force at that point. So the question would be, well, where are you allowed to talk about? Well, anywhere on Earth or inside of it, right? If you want to dig down three miles, the gravitational force is going to be different there. So your domain is, is this whole ball, right? The output is gravity at each of those points. So you pick me a point. So plug it into some function, it's going to spit out the gravity at that point. Understand? I hope that makes sense. Another one would be uh, temperature. Just think about the temperature in a room, right? The temperature in this room. Of course, if you look on the wall, there's a thermostat. But, it, you know, if we have a very precise instrument for measuring temperature, the temperature right here at this point is different than the temperature right here at this point, right? And so you could have the input is anything in this room, any point in this room, and the output is the temperature at that point. So you would have this function that takes in where you are and spits out the temperature at that. So these are actually very useful functions where your input's three variables. Okay. We're done with that one? Obviously I don't have a picture of that function. All right, so your homework assignment. Um, these are the homework assignments that I, I do want you to do. I have not put out the, the assignments for Chapter 11 yet on our website. So just, let's just go off of these. Um, I'll write them on the board to the side so you have them. Page 623, 1 through 12. And I put try the range. If you get hung up on range, don't worry too much about it. Moving on to 11.2. Well, if we're going to start talking about functions, 
then we're going to go back to Cal 1 again, and we're going to talk about limits, right? So, I mean, do you get that there's kind of a theme here? We started this out, we started talking about vectors, but then we said, hey, look, there's these things called vector functions, right? What do vector functions of one variable draw? So, like, what did the vector function r of t draw? Line. Sometimes a line. Curves. curves, right? Vector functions like r of t would draw a curve. Right? That might be in two space or in three space. Now we just talked about, all right, z is, oh wait, and when we did this, didn't we talk about derivatives, right? We talked about limits, we talked about derivatives, we talked about integrals, didn't we? Now what we're doing is we're looking at z as some function of two variables. We're saying that's a surface. And so what might, this is a function, it's a surface. What might come naturally now is, okay, well let's talk about limits and continuity and derivatives and integrals of these, right? And what do they mean? That's, that's where we're going. So the first thing is the limit. So for the limit, this is tricky. Remember from Cal 1 the definition of a limit. Remember this notation? Limit x goes to a of f of x equals a meant that as x got closer to a, the function got closer to l. So a picture of this is this right here. So here's some function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my x values get closer to 0. So here I go. Notice the points on the graph, right? As my function gets closer, the x values get closer to 0. What is the function approaching? 1. Ah, oh, shit. What happened? Well, I don't, oh, because here's the function. The function is actually sine of x over x. Is it defined at 0? No, you can't plug 0 into this, can you? But the limit as you approach 0 is defined. It's getting closer to 1, obviously. We just can't actually let it go to 1, then the, then the computer freaks out, right? So the limit was all about what was happening as you were getting close to a point. It had nothing to do with what was happening at the point, right? How is this going to work with a surface? Hmm. Here's another example, another function as we approach zero from both sides. Look, if we come in from the left, what's my function approaching? One. As we come in from the right, what is the function approaching? Zero. See, so from the left side and from the right side, two different values. What would we say in this case? It's discontinuous. We'd say the limit does not exist, right? So what we needed in Cal 1 for the limit to exist is that from the left and the right, they had to go towards the same place, right? It was OK for, for the limit. It was OK to have a hole as long as they both went to the same place, yes? But you had to check both from the left and the right, didn't you? All right, well, doesn't seem so bad. The important thing in two-dimensional two space, the important thing was that um, the limit had to exist from both sides, all right? That was the main thing. Now here's the actual notation that we use for limits with functions of two variables. See, when you were in a limit in Cal 1, x was approaching something, right? You were just approaching along the x-axis. But now our function is a function of two variables. So your input is, is actually an ordered pair. So you want that ordered pair to be approaching another ordered pair. Try and illustrate it. Cal 1, you have y as a function of x. The domain in Cal 1 was one dimensional, wasn't it, the domain? And so if I draw you this, and I say, hey, everyone, get closer to A, then you would come in from this side or this side, right? This is the domain. Yeah? That's Cal 1. What we're talking about now, Cal 3, is that this is the domain, right? You're in two-dimensional space. And now approach a point for me. That point right there, I'm going to call it AB. Approach that point and tell me what the function's doing above that. What's, what's going to be the problem? 
Does anyone see the problem? I wonder if anyone can see it ahead of time here. Which way are you going to approach it, right? With this one right here, there's only two ways to approach this point, right? From the left or from the right. How many different ways can I approach this point? Infinitely many ways. Look, could I come in like this? I could come in with along this line, all these points right there, and that would approach that point, wouldn't it? And then I could do this and say, uh, yeah, I'll do a little curve action and then go towards that point. I could do that. Why not? I could come in and, and, and curl through like this, right, and approach that point like that. I could do something crazy. I could start like almost like this death spiral into it, like right, and just head into it. There's no longer just two ways to approach the point like there was in Cal 1. And that is a huge problem. Because for the limit to exist, you have to be able to show that it's approaching the, func the, the function is approaching an L from every possible direction in every possible path, which you can never do. Do you understand that? You can never check every path. You don't have enough time in your life to do that. Now, there is going to be some work around to it, but I just want you to see the inherent problem that we run into when it comes to functions of two variables. That's a notation. All right, let's move on. I'm probably going to reiterate exactly what I just said here. Big question is how many ways can we approach it? So I think I just showed you, you know, here's, here's a point I can approach it, right? I can come in any way. And see what's happening on the function, right? This is my domain on the ground. This is the function. I can come into that point so many different ways that imagine that on the surface, you're just kind of approaching that point on the surface from all these different directions. Infinite number of ways that we can approach it. For the limit to exist, must exist for every path. And therefore, our life's going to suck. All right, so let's try this. We are going to investigate this function. This is my actual function of x right here. And I want to know what the limit is as x, y approaches 0, 0. And I'm going to look at several different paths. So we have a couple of paths that we like to always try first. And we're hoping for the best. But let's be clear. If I come in and I do a limit right now and you get an answer of 1, that does not mean the answer is 1 to the problem. That means from one direction it was 1. Then I would have to check every other direction, which is impossible. So what do you think it is that I'm actually going to hope for? Going to hope that from different paths I get different answers, right? If I get different answers from different paths, the limit does not exist. So it's easier for us to check that a limit doesn't exist than it is for us to check that it does. What we don't want to happen here is keep on getting the same answer every time we come in from different paths. Because every time we do, all it does is just tells us we need another path and we're never going to run out of paths. So let's try uh, one of the first paths that you'll want to come in on. Remember, I'm in two-dimensional space. What point am I approaching? I'm approaching the point 0, 0, which is right here. Right? I'm approaching 0, 0. And one path we really like is the x-axis, like back in Cal 1. Let's come in along the left and right-hand sides like this. Okay, So we're going to come in like this. That's a path, isn't it? And that line that I'm coming in on is actually the line y equals 0, right? Which is the x-axis, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this limit, and I'm going to fix my y value at 0. Not approaching 0. I'm going to fix y to be 0. And I'm going to rewrite this limit. So here's, the, here's what it'll look like. Limit as x0 approaches 0, 0. Notice I replaced the y with 0. And then everywhere in here, I'm going to replace y with 0. So x squared minus 0 squared over x squared plus 0 squared. Oh, 
which equals limit x0 approaches 0, 0 of, well, that's just x squared over x squared, right? And what's x squared over x squared? That's going to be 1, right? That's 1. I can reduce this before I take the limit. So this is just going to be, I'll, I'll write it one more time. Limit is x0 approaches 0, 0 of 1. And what's the limit of a constant? Just the constant. So we get 1. OK. So what appears to be happening is that if I were to be looking on the ground and looking at the x-axis and coming in like this, right? then up on the function, I should be up approaching 1, shouldn't I? Up on the surface. It should be approaching a, a height of 1. Now I'm going to show you a picture of all this in a second, but I just want you to kind of see it, uh, try and see it mentally before I show it to you visually. All right, so that's, that's 1. Now let's try a different path. Let's try along, how about the y-axis? Does that seem like a natural choice for the next one? Come in this way. OK, so now let's go along the y-axis which is the equation x equals 0, and do my limit. This time I'm replacing x with 0. So it's 0y instead of xy. And then replace all my x's with 0, which gives you negative y squared over y squared, which is negative 1. Right? which means at this point I can stop and I can say this limit doesn't exist. Because from two different paths, I was approaching two different values. Understand that? We got lucky. That's the first example. So limit does not exist. That's the conclusion of this. Question, yes? Mm -hmm. If the limit is going to exist, then we need to get one here and one here for every path you can ever come up with, which, again, is impossible. So we're hoping that through different paths, eventually we get them to be something different. If we just keep on getting one, 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 you're just going to be like, I've got to find the path that's going to screw it up, but maybe it is one. But you can't check every possible. So you're really kind of backed into a corner here. Do you see that? All right, so let's take a look at the, let's take a look at the, the visual of this. See if you can make sense out of this visual. This, this is along the x-axis. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the surface out completely, just so you can see what's happening. If you look at it from this side, well, I guess this is OK. Along the x-axis, see that green dot? Yes? The green dot is just the input. And the black dot is actually the output of the function. So do you see as the x value changes, do you see that the, y, the z value, I'm sorry, the yeah, the x value moves along. Do you see that the uh, z value is just staying up there at 1? Something happened there. Do you all see my computer freaked out there for a second? Right there, when I went through the origin, what happened? It tried to plug in the point 0, 0. But you can't because 0, 0 in, into this is going to be you know, undefined, right? But if you're getting closer and closer, it looks like that, that output is 1, isn't it? Do you all see that? I'm going to come in and bring that surface back in. There's something really weird happening in there. Do you see that, that little dip in there? OK. So it looks like from the side, it's almost like a fortune cookie, right, or something. It's like folded across the top. And you're running along that top edge. And then all of a sudden, at the origin, it drops down, right? It actually becomes undefined. It doesn't drop down, just is undefined. But along that x-axis, it's up there at 1. Understand? No questions? OK, now let's look along the y-axis. We come in along the y-axis. See, now we're along the y-axis. The green is the input. The black is the output. Notice that the black is below it, isn't it? So it's down there at negative 1. 
There's that surface. We were coming along this edge, right? Now we're, we're down along this bottom edge down here. Y'all see it or not? I, give me some feedback. Yes, you see it? Okay. So as soon as we had different answers, we were good. So the, the conclusion is that this limit does not exist since we got different answers from different paths. Now let's take this path, or this, this new limit. So let's go back to our kind of always proceed this way. Always start with uh, maybe the x-axis, then go to y-axis. Okay, if I'm going to go along the x-axis, I'm going to let uh, y be 0 first, right? This limit's going to be the limit as x0 approaches 0, 0 of now replace Replace y with 0 in there, and what do you get? On the top, you get 0, right? Over what? x squared. Now, are we saying here that this top is approaching 0, or are we saying that the top is 0? Is 0, right? Because I am actually sitting here saying, let y be 0 so that I'm on the x-axis, not near it, on it, right? If I'm on the um, x-axis, y is, I, is exactly 0, and then the top is not approaching, it actually is 0. And then 0, the number 0, divided by any number would be what? Yeah. It should be 0 as long as this is what? Not 0. But what are we doing? We're letting x approach 0 without actually getting there, right? So these numbers down here are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, never actually being zero, so we never actually have division by zero. So the answer to this is zero. Now, similarly, if we come in along the y-axis, let x be zero. Do you all see what's going to happen? You're going to get zero again. But 0 over what this time? y squared. You get the same answer. So does that mean that the limit is 0? No. It means that along those two paths, the same thing's happening. So what should we try next? Or what should we do next? Yeah, let's do a different path. What do you want to try? y equals negative x. y equals negative x. That's a good path. Um, the one that we usually go to next is the diagonal, which negative x might also, it's another diagonal. But let's go with y equals x as our next choice. So we're going to approach 0, 0 along the diagonal. So that'll be y equals x. We call that the, the identity function. That's called the identity function, back from college algebra. So let's approach along the identity and see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace all my y's with x's. And I'm going to rewrite the limit up here. Limit, not, instead of x, y, I'm going to write x, x approaches 0, 0 of x times x over x squared plus x squared. So all my y's became x's. What is the top? Top is x squared, so limit x, x approaches 0, 0 of x squared over 2x squared, 1 half. Done. This limit doesn't exist. We found a path that made it not happen, right? Understand that? Questions? <laughs> That's a great question. Until you run out of lead or, or time. I don't know. Um, most of the problems on the homework, you, it's going to happen somewhere in here. But there are some more unnatural choices, which the, the last example I'm going to do will be a, a less natural choice. Okay. Sometimes you just have to think about what's happening in here and how you can get things to change by manipulating what x and y are. 
Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. This is a function. Do you all have any idea what this looks like? It's a function that if you come in along the x-axis, it's approaching 0. Along the y-axis, it's approaching 0. But if you come in along the diagonal, the function is approaching the value of 1 half. So is it still a fortune cookie? Let's see. It kind of looks like a fortune cookie still. Right? You all see that? So let's come in along the x-axis. There's my x-axis coming in. Notice that we're just running along the edge of this graph. I don't know if y'all can see that. Along the x-axis, we're just kind of, there's this dip in the function. We're just kind of running along this edge, right? And it's, oh, our, con, our z value is always just constant through that. And then we try and come in on the y-axis, the same thing happens. So here's along the y-axis, we get that same edge effect running along this edge, always staying constant at zero. On the other side, same thing, right? Look at that from the top, running along the y-axis. But now if we try and come in along that y equals x, there's, the, there's along y equals x. And you can see pretty obviously that we're up on that top ridge now. So we're up at 1 half. Got it? See, this is, where, this is where we're at a point in the class, and a lot of it's going to be like this the rest of the way. I'm curious to know, as a student, from a student's perspective, how much of this would make sense without that picture? I, I just I wonder. Like, would you see it the same way? I don't know. Or would it just be just the limit, and you're just like, OK, how do we calculate the limit? I don't know. To me, I think the visual is just there to help us see how it's tied to something. It's not just like a limit. OK, so the answer was does not exist. OK, last one. You want to try? You want to try, try and go in along a couple of paths. You're good. How many of you see right away along the x and y axis you get the same answer? Do y'all see that right away from looking at it? Because you have x times y squared on the top, as soon as you let x be 0, the top is 0. If you let y be 0, the top is 0. In both cases, the denominators are going to be x squared or y to the fourth, depending on what you set. So it's going to be very similar to the last problem, right?
Anybody get this? How many of you um, got to this one, tried y equals x? What happens? What do you get? What does it turn into? This algebraically is really just what? x cubed over x squared plus x to the fourth, right? What can you do with this? You factor out an x squared. So you'll get uh, x squared on top factored out. On the bottom factor out x squared, you get 1 plus x squared, right? Cancel those out. So what happens here? If x goes to 0, what happens here? You get 0, don't you? You get 0? Does that help you? No, that didn't help. So what next? What's your next path? X equals y squared? Where's that coming from? From magic? X is y squared. So think about this. If this was y squared, then this would be what? Y to the fourth. And if this x squared was y squared, then you're taking y squared and squaring it, which again is y to the fourth. And so you'll have y to the fourth on top over 2y to the fourths, and that'll reduce and become the fraction 1 half. So that, you, you have to just kind of understand what's happening in here, and that'll work that, it'll work that way. Do you all get that? So th this path, what was it? X is what? X is y squared. X is y squared. So let me replace that. This limit's going to be limit. Instead of x, I'm going to put what here? y squared y approaches 0, 0. Replace my x with y squared. So y squared times y squared on top over y squared squared plus y to the fourth. which is essentially y to the fourth over 2y to the fourth, which turns into 1 half, doesn't it? And that's all we need to say it doesn't exist. Now, what does that path look like? It's parabola sideways. So if I approach 0, 0 on that path, I get 1 half. But if I approach along the x-axis, it's approaching 0. If I approach along the y-axis, it's approaching 0. If I approach along the diagonal, it's approaching 0. So this ought to be a pretty interesting looking function, right? Does anyone have any questions over that? We're good? I'm going to show you the picture of this one because it's pretty cool. There it is. Look at that, look at that top ridge. Can you see that top ridge? Right in there? The top ridge? You're walking along that top ridge, you're up at one half. That's that parabola. But if you come in the y-axis or the x-axis, you're down at zero, even along the diagonal. So let's see. There's along the y-axis. It's zero along the x-axis. Oh, can you see through? You can see through it, can't you? That's through. Now remember, at zero, zero, you have this, this undefined thing happening. Oh, this is cool. Let me show you this. Part of why I wanted to go through this. You know, you know how we checked just a second ago? We checked y was x. Right, y equals x was one path. There's another path that you can choose that's, that's really kind of, you know, you, you've heard the term like killing two birds with one stone. This is killing an infinite number of birds with one stone. What I could do is come in on the path y equals mx. So think about this. y equals mx is going to be a line that goes through the origin, right? If m is 1, then it's this one, isn't it? 
If m is negative 1, it's this one. If m is 2, it's this one. If m is 3, it's this one, right? So what I'm going to do is instead of fixing my slope, I'm going to let it be arbitrary. And now I'm going to rewrite that limit again. Limit, I'm replacing y with mx. So it's x, mx. I hope you understand we already have the answer to this problem. Do you all get that? OK, but this is uh, another choice you could do that is pretty powerful when it comes to actually um, evaluating this. So check this out. Um, I'm replacing my y with what? mx. So it becomes x times uh, m mx squared over what x squared plus mx to the fourth. And the question is, what is th this? So I'm going to have to, to be correct, you know, precise with my notation, I need to rewrite this limit again, right? That's a lot to write, and it's class time. So I'm just going to write, this is all L, OK? I do that when I'm doing the homework problems, too, because it's too much writing. So this here, on a test, please write it down, OK? It's not that bad. What is the top here? m squared x cubed on the bottom, x squared plus m to the fourth, x to the fourth. Yeah? All right, let's keep going. That limit becomes, this limit becomes factor out an x squared on the top. You're left with m squared x. And on the bottom, you're left with, uh, let's see, pull the x squared out. You're left with 1 plus m to the fourth x squared. We good? Just algebra here. Cancel. And so we're left with limit as m squared x um, of m squared x over 1 plus m to the fourth x squared. So what am I supposed to let go to what here? Let x go to 0, and what do you get? 0, regardless of m, right? Regardless of what you choose m to be. If you choose m to be any number, go ahead. Give me a number, fix it. I don't care what it is. This limit's going to go to 0, isn't it? For all m. So that means every path. This is crazy. Think about this. If you draw me the, this right here, and you approach 0, 0, if you approach that on any straight line, any straight line, the limit is 0. But if you approach along x equals y squared, it's 1 half. So you would think that this takes care of every path, right? But they're all straight line paths. It has to hold for all paths, period. That's, that's a very, very um, profound thing. So what I had done here is I had built into my code a way of, a way of actually changing the paths. So I'm going to take the surface out of here. And, well, I'll bring it in. And now I'm just going to rotate. Notice that all these different paths, if I look at it from the top, maybe that'll make a little more sense. All these paths that I have approach 0, 0 on any of these lines. Do you all see that? And if I look at the surface, and I start coming in from any of those lines, no matter what, when you approach 0, 0, oh, sorry about that. I'm looking at my screen. There's nothing there. So all this shit's getting in the way. See, no matter how I approach it, from which line, this black part is the actual part that's on the surface. They all want to go to zero, zero, like to zero, no matter what. It's pretty cool. So should we try y equals mx after we try to zero, zero? You could. You could. Um, sometimes the algebra of having mx in there can be pretty nasty. But you know that if you get an answer, then it's, you know, so it's really up to you. I usually do x is 0, y is 0, y is x, hoping for the best. And if that doesn't work, then I think of mx, but I also think of, can I see what I can do to make it become a nice thing, like the x was y squared? Any other questions or comments? I'm going to go back to that in a second. We're going to look at this one. Look, you could spend all day 
trying to figure out two paths that make this one different, this limit. You could all day long. You're never going to get it because this limit does exist. Right? Every path as you go to 0, 0, every single path goes to the same thing. Now the question is how do we show it if you can't check every path? And what we're going to use is something we had in Cal 1 called the squeeze theorem. What we're going to do is we're going to take this function and we're going to try and squeeze that thing between two things and then show that those two things go to the same place which forces this one to the same place. So I think what I'll do is I'll start by writing down an inequality because that's what you always need for the squeeze theorem, an inequality. And how you pick this, well, watch me and then maybe it'll make sense why I chose this. Do you agree that that quantity is greater than or equal to zero? Yes? Do you all agree with that? And do you agree that that's also less than or equal to one? That's a little bit more difficult to understand, maybe. If I cover up this, 2y squared, what's x squared over x squared? 1, and then there would be equality, wouldn't there? Now, if I put a number in here, I'm adding 2 times y squared. This number, the, the least it could ever be is 0, right? Other than that, it's going to be positive number. Added to x squared, this denominator would get bigger, right? If the denominator gets bigger, the ratio gets smaller. So this, this, this um, rational expression must be less than or equal to 1, right? OK, so does everyone see that this piece in here is everything up there except the sine squared y? Everyone see that? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply each of these by sine squared y. So what's 0 times sine squared y? 0 is less than or equal to this times sine squared y, which is the thing I'm interested in, isn't it? Isn't that what I'm interested in? But that has to be less than or equal to 1 times sine squared y. You still with me? Why didn't I have to worry about flipping inequalities? Because don't you have to worry sometimes, like if you multiply by a negative, it flips? Why am I not concerned about that? It's not negative, sine squared, right? So it's never, that's not a negative number, so I don't have to concern myself with that. So what we do now is once we have the thing we're interested in, which is this, once we have it squeezed between two things, we need to make sure that these two things go to the same value as we approach in a limit. So what I need to do is this now. I need to set up this inequality again with limits. So this right here, I want the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of 0, that's this one, is less than or equal to the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of x squared sine squared y over x squared plus 2y squared. That's less than or equal to the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of sine squared y. Yeah? Is it going to get squeezed? We, we don't know what this is, right? This is what the whole problem started as, right? This limit, whatever it is, must be greater than that limit right there. What's this limit right here? The limit of a constant is going to 0. That must be less than or equal to this, right? Which we don't know. We're trying to figure out what the hell that is. But that must be what? Less than or equal to whatever that limit is. And do you see what's good about this limit? X isn't even here, right, which is nice. And if Y goes to 0, sine of 0 is 0. 0 squared is 0. So this limit is just 0. So what's the only possibility? If we're saying this limit has to be somewhere between 0 and 0, it must be 0. That's the squeeze theorem. You've squeezed it. Now, you can mess the squeeze theorem up. Because if, let's say you try and do some nice stuff and then you get something over here, like let's just say for the hell of it, that this was this, right? Let's just say. Then you would be squeezing it between where and where? Zero and one. Well, congratulations. You have a window of where it is, but 
that means that it could be fluctuating, could be one half, then it could be you know three quarters, and then back to one half and three. So it's in a window that does not nail it down. It has to be going to the same place on both sides, which is what we had. So we're happy about that. But I had to be clever, kind of clever, about the way I set up my initial inequality, right? And that's what the most challenging thing is for um, these types of problems. On a test, if I were to give you a problem like this, I will tell you, show the limit exists. And if I say show the limit exists, then you know automatically it's going to be something like this. If I say something like show the limit does not exist, then you're going to be testing paths. See the difference in the language? OK. There's also a problem on the homework um, where it says to show the limit exists. And what they do, it's crazy. You'll see it when you get to it if you work on it, is that they don't even do a squeeze theorem. They just look at the original limit that looks like something like that. There's the original limit. And it has some radicals in it. And they just come in and multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate. Remember the conjugate? And when they do that, it becomes a new thing, and it's a real easy limit. But again, it's not a very natural move just to come in with a conjugate. But it works. So be prepared for that. You'll see it on the homework. I think that's it. Um, continuity, not really going to get too, too much into this. Um, continuity back in Cal 1 just meant that you, know, you have a function. There you would say the limit exists, right? For continuity, continuity, we would actually need the function to be defined there, and it would fill in that hole, right? Same sort of thing for these <coughs> surfaces. If we want a function of two variables to be continuous at a point, then the limit actually has to exist. So from every path, it's going to the same value. And when you actually get to that value, it's filled in. So there's no like puncture in the surface, right? But we're not going to you know, show continuity or anything like that. But we will use this result. <coughs> and this, again, ties into Cal 1. What types of functions are continuous? So from Cal 1, you know, po all polynomials are continuous. All uh, trig functions and uh, rational functions are continuous on their implied domains. So it's kind of the same sort of thing. All polynomial functions of x and y are continuous everywhere. All rational functions are continuous on their implied domains. And the composition of continuous functions are continuous on their implied domains. So I guess all that's saying right here is that <coughs> If someone were to give you a function like this, right there, and they would ask you, if you were to draw that, would it have any punctures or holes in it? Is it continuous? And you would say, well, it's continuous everywhere except where? Where what's what? Everywhere except where x squared equals y squared. That's where you would have a problem, right? But that, these numbers are not in the domain, right? And that's what this is saying. All rational functions are continuous on their implied domains. The implied domain of this is everything except the, the numbers that satisfy this. Where, what does that look like geometrically? x equals x squared equals y squared. x equals y? would not be allowed to be in our picture. And x equals negative y would not be allowed in our picture. So our domain would actually be everything in here, everything in here, everything in here, everything in here. That's what it would look like. I wonder what that would look like if you graphed it. It'd be kind of interesting. You would have a bunch of dipping down and, and going up. Should we see it? I just kind of made that one up. Um, plot, 3D, what was it, x squared plus y squared over x squared minus y squared. I'll go negative uh, 4. <laughs>
There you go. Oh, there it is. Okay, so look, the computer is having some issues. It's having some issues, right? So I'm gonna have I'm gonna do a couple of things to make this look a little bit nicer. First, I'm gonna take the mesh out. I don't like the meshing. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna force it to um, plot more points. And let's try um, 25 first to see. That got a little bit nicer. Let me try 40. It's pretty easy to bring the computer to its knees here if you go too far with this. There we go. That's a lot better. Do y'all see that? Huh? Can y'all see that? It's a little better? It's a lot better. Thank you. Um, how about we do this? Um, range. <laughs> range. Um, let's go range 20. Oh, plot range. Oops. Uh, that didn't help. Well, you get the idea, don't you? You got the idea. If you look at it from the side like this, it looks a lot like a rational function from Cal 1, right? I mean, sorry, from college algebra. Rational, but it's a big surface of them. So this is just, these like vertical pieces are like where the computer's like, I don't know what to do, so it draws a vertical sheet. You can't do that. How many of you have, remember graphing on your graphing calculator, a rational function will do something like this, and then it'll draw a straight line down, and then it'll draw the other side like that. That's exactly what's happening here with the computer. The computer is um, having a problem with that. So I'm going off, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get you all interested in this program. Um, exclusions. And then I've got to remember the syntax for this. Exclusions x squared equals y squared. I think I may have messed this up, but I'm going to try. Ugh, OK, there we go. That worked. So what I did is I told the computer that if you ever try and plug in x squared equals y, y squared, to not do that, to take those out. I hate this stupid box they put around it, too. <laughs> what? There's a lot that goes into making it look pretty. Axis origin, 0, 0, 0. There we go. OK, that's about as good as it's going to get. You'll see it now? See, I, I, I help the computer f not freak out anymore. That's what that surface looks like. So it's continuous on its implied domain. So as long as you're on the sheet itself, you're not going to have any weird punctures in it. It does become asymptotic. Right? But it's not going to be like all of a sudden you're moving along and all of a sudden whoosh, it just vanishes. It's going to be some sort of continuous sheet. Are we at the end of the notes? We are. And we have just, there's the homework, page 32. That's, that's not a very uh, big assignment there, page 632. 5 through 13 odd. All right. We have, what, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes? I think that's just enough time for us to get introduced to the next topic, all right? I know, come on, it's Monday, right? <sighs> Partial derivatives. Okay, so we've taken care of limits, we've taken care of continuity. The next thing that comes is derivatives. How many of you have heard of partial derivatives before? You've, in, you've taken partial derivatives where? Where have you seen that? 
Physics, you're taking partial derivatives? Sum and differential equations? Yeah, absolutely. So what the heck is a partial derivative? Well, we're going to try and get a, a visual of it um, to start here with functions of two variables, although the idea extends to functions of three variables and four variables. But it's, it's really easy to see with functions of two variables. So we're going to begin by just reminding ourselves of what it was like in Cal 1. Right? This is a function of a single variable, f of x, y equals f of x. If we said, what's the derivative, what you do is you'd move to some point, you'd go up on the graph, right, and you'd calculate the slope of that tangent line, and the slope of that tangent line was the derivative, right? As I moved around, as I change, change the x value, the derivative's value changes, right? Good. Nothing new there, right? The problem we encounter with functions of several variables is that we actually have two variables to start with. This makes determining a single tangent line difficult. So imagine, um, just for the sake of simplicity, that we're looking at that one problem that was the, the top of the ball, right? Just a dome. If I pick some point on this dome and I ask you, what's the slope of the tangent line? Why is that going to be sort of a confusing question? Tangent, I mean, just touches the ball at one point. Which direction, right? Like, what do you mean? Like, okay, so you've got this dome, right? Here's the dome. And let's say my knuckle right there is the, a point. I put this line on it. I can draw a point that, that goes just through that point, right? I draw a line that goes just through that point, and I can talk about its slope. But then, you know, I could also have come up with the line that goes this way through that point, right? And so it, it depends on what direction you're in, doesn't it? Yeah? So that's what makes it a little more complicated. Look, when we're back on a sheet of paper, and I say, all right, go to this curve and pick some point and give me the slope of tangent line, there's no other dimension where that line right there can pop off the page and start spinning around like this, see? Right? So this was OK because we were, we were fixed, we were stuck. But in 3D, that thing can, can spin around. So because of that, we have to pay attention to the direction we're pointing. And what would be one particular direction that might be pretty natural for us to think? So to, per, perpendicular how? I'm going to try and do a demo without help, uh, hurting myself. So the, the um, x-axis is going out that wall over there, right? The y-axis is coming out over here, yes? Z is up. There's a surface right here. I'm going to go climb up on the surface. Where's my, I better bring this with me. OK, so I'm going to go climb up on the surface onto a point. Okay. I know, this might get dangerous. Hold on. OK, so I'm up here on the surface, right? And, and I'm, there's, there's some curvature to it, so I'm kind of keeping myself balanced on it. And I'm going to try and put this on that point that's on the surface. Which, which way should I point? Should I point over there? Should I point over here? Which way should I point? What seems natural to you? Over what? OK, so follow one of the axes. So that x-axis went out that way, right? So why don't I rotate this? And so I'm going through that point, but I'm, I'm running parallel to the x-axis, right? Another way I could point, got physics going on up here, OK? So I could point parallel to the y-axis, couldn't I? Of course, I could do anything else, too. But naturally, it seems like down the same directions as the axes would be our first place to start. And that's where we do start. Does that make sense? Now later on, we realize that you know, it doesn't matter which direction you point. We have something called the directional derivative, which you can change that direction to whatever you want it to be. But for now, it's going to be parallel to the axes. So here it comes. Here's me standing on that surface. Do you see me right there? See me at that point? Yeah? Now, I've got my x-axis coming out this way towards you, which was like the room over there. And then over here, yes? And so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to point down parallel to the x-axis, which should be like this. Why did that get smaller? 
So it's like I was standing up on there, right? And I came through and I cut through the whole surface with a plane, didn't I? When I cut through the surface with a plane, that means the Y coordinate on any of those points, right? is fixed. Remember, y is the distance from here over. I'm fixing that. So do you all, all see that? That's y equals a constant. Right? Your y-axis is along this back wall. I'm fixing that y to be constant. Do you all see it that way? If I fix y to be constant, then this plane actually cuts through my surface. And where it cuts through the surface, it creates a, a curve, doesn't it? Yes? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to so remember, y right now is fixed constant, right? y is fixed to be constant. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull the actual surface out of here because it's just going to get in our way. And then I'm going to walk way down the y-axis, way down there, and turn around and take a look at it. And when I do that, that's what I see. Right? And this is a Cal 1 problem now. You have a curve, right? And we could very easily find the slope of that line, which would be there. And if I want to, remember y is fixed, right? Y is fixed. If I change my x value, I will move along this curve, won't I? Now I'm going to bring the picture back in because I think it's important for you to see where I just came from. There it is. I'm going to bring the surface back into this. Here it comes. Okay. So all I had done, I started the problem like this. I cut it through with the, with the plane, right? Y is a constant. Took the surface out, came from way on this side, and looked at it. Why did I come on this side? Well, because that means these x values are positive to my right and my z values are positive this way. If I were to have come in from the other side, then it would have been x negative values. So that's why I chose to look at it from here. Do you all see it? Surface gone. There it is. Now, that was with me standing up on the chair, deciding to point in the direction that was parallel to the x-axis. But we also said, let's do the y-axis. So let's take a look at how that changes the problem. So I'm going to take that out of here. Bring the surface back in. Bring my point back to some reasonable position. There we go. And then take that out of there. Well, actually, I think I'll leave it there for a second so you can see when I fix an x value, the plane I'm cutting through with is running this way now, right? Perpendicular to the other one. So I'll take the other one out. I'll pull the surface out. And then I'll just kind of turn it and look at it this way. This curve lives more in like the YZ plane, doesn't it? YZ. I'm going, to go, I'm going to go walk way out to infinity and take a look backwards. <coughs> Pull that surface completely out. And now I've got this. And that should have a tangent line. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong thing. Oops. X infinity. There we go. So now, if I change my y value, because x is fixed, right? Then I get this. So here's what it comes down to. When you have a function of two variables, to talk about slopes of tangent lines, you have to fix one variable to be constant. <clears throat> right? Fix one. If you fix one, then we just get a curve, back in, like we are in Cal 1. We fix x to be constant, something happens. If we fix y, we get something else. So I'm going to go last one back to the original picture. I'm going to bring this in. I'm going to show you both of them at the same time. But I think what I'll do is I'll take the planes out of there. And so we have, I don't know, did the planes help? Two different, two different tangent lines, don't we? Two different tangent lines. So what we have here is, am I over on time? OK, all right. No, I, just, I hear everyone packing up. I'm just making sure like class didn't end at 2.30. Um, if I fix my y value, if I hold my y value constant, 
we call that the partial derivative with respect to x, meaning that x is the variable, y is the constant. If you hold the x variable constant, it's called the partial derivative with respect to y, and you get a different answer, sometimes, not all time. So that's where we will, we will pick up next time. We will talk about this definition, and then we'll go through and we'll actually do some partial derivatives. Yes? They were perpendicular to one another, yes. Uh-huh. Hey, and you tell me, if, if you actually have two lines, right, those two lines should define a plane, shouldn't they? And so we actually don't have really a concept of a tangent line here. It's a tangent plane. It's a tangent plane. So imagine a basketball and you have a sheet on top of it. You move that around. That's what we have instead of a tangent line on a surface. Tangent plane moving around the whole thing. You only need one what? Partial? No, to define a plane, because one partial derivative would just give you a single line.